Now, yeah. maybe I could ask you a little bit about that. Um, mm -hmm. So I want to get to supersymmetry, but before I do. <laughs> I see. Yes. Okay. Go on. We're going to make you work this morning, sir. I can understand that. Yeah. <laughs> um, so here, here's my question. Am I correct that you've lived through two eras, an era of fairly rapid development in testable fundamental physics coming from theory. Mm -hmm. I've tried to be very careful about setting that up so I don't walk into a trap. <laughs> and yeah. a, a stagnant theory, uh, era in which theoretical predictions coming uh, at the level of fundamental theory have not been rapidly confirmed um, by experiment. You're thinking of things like string theory? Or? I'm thinking about a <clears throat> regime before the early 70s and a regime following the early 70s. Well, supersymmetry. Is that what you meant? Well, it could be grand unified theory, supersymmetry, oh, yeah. technicolor. Yeah, it could be asymptotic theory. safety. It could be any one yeah. of a number of speculative theories from loop quantum gravity, Reggie calculus, Actually, string all theory. Those, yes, sure, sure. It's like the, 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 the kitchen sink. We've tried a million different things that don't. Yeah, yeah. They didn't really pan out, you mean? <laughs> well, it seems like, well, if you'll permit a, an American metaphor, um, we've been waved into third base and we've been waiting for the signal to come home for about 50 years. And we're not even sure that anyone's still, uh, uh, you know, there at home plate. Well, you see, you might be wrong, playing the wrong game. That's the trouble. You think rounders would do it? <laughs> well, I mean, there's a lot of intriguing ideas. And <clears throat> you mentioned, basically, I, I think you were hinting at supersymmetry is one of them which but well, maybe i've thrown off close to 10 i pre i could do it yeah, pretty it easily but i guess you had there's nothing new about that they were the, you, people were playing around with knots and things i'm mean, kelvin was the idea that knots might be at the basis uh, of particle identity or, yeah, yeah yeah i mean th these ideas come back again in a different form but certainly in the I guess the 19th century, people were playing with, well, I guess you can go back further than that. Phlogiston. <laughs> well, that's true. But I would say that Maxwell was the first great condensation of uh, theoretical ideas where an enormous amount of theory yeah. surrounding yeah. magnetism, electricity, visible light, invisible light well that was a huge huge revolution and that yeah. all of those things now um can be unpacked from a single geometric equation but p that's the thing i mean people know about galileo they know about newton they know about kepler they know about einstein and they also may know about um, the modern quantum field theory heisenberg schrodinger people how many people know about maxwell not enough. Not enough. Although Max people do have Maxwell's equations tattooed on their backsides. Well, some people do. Yes. Not so <laughs> but the sort of general public don't know about Maxwell. But Maxwell's equations completely changed our way of looking at the world. And uh, we live off it without thinking. You know, you've got these lights here. Well, the, these are visible lights. So we, we know you knew about visible light, but we didn't know anything about X-rays, X-rays, radio waves, they're all part of the same scheme. Electromagnetism, dynam well, some of this goes back to Faraday just before Maxwell. Sure. So Faraday had a lot of the influential ideas, electromagnetism. Well, well there were, a little bit of that was known before Ersted knew that if you had an electric current, then you get a magnetic field. But it was the other way around with Maxwell. Now, if you have a varying magnetic field, you get a current. And you combine these ideas, you can make a dynamo. So these, these things go to Faraday. And he had sort of clues that there might be some connection with light. But he didn't have the equations. And it but was even Max, you know, I'm very partial to this book on orchids that followed Darwin's Origin of Species. Oh, yeah. That was the book he wrote. 
the title is, uh, and I always I love reciting it. It's uh, on the various contrivances by which British and foreign orchids are fertilized by insects. <laughs> and so you think, well, why would he write a damn fool book like that after Origin of Species? And the answer is he wanted to test whether he understood his own theory. And in fact, it's revealed that he didn't understand the full implications. He, he, I would say that yeah. the same thing is true of Maxwell's equations, which is this mm. is perhaps the best dress rehearsal for unification we've ever seen. Oh yeah, you know, full unification. And on the other hand. It's not until the late 50s that we actually unpack the last trivial consequence of the theory with uh, the, this bizarre effect of passing an electron beam around an insulated uh, <laughs> wire. That, I don't know. Uh. Yeah, in fact, we, we had dinner last night. We, yeah. uh, we asked Yakir Aronoff uh, <laughs> if he wanted to come, but he's in Israel and he sends his regards. Oh, you yeah, know. Well, send mine back oh, we will, we will <laughs> yes. do um, no no he, he's great fun i always but that was a, a lot that, was, that was a yeah. very weird thing where we learned that yeah. um if you have a an insulated solenoid that the phase of the electron beam going in a, a circle around it would be shifted despite the fact that the electromagnetic field mm. could be treated as zero because the electromagnetic potential this precursor yeah turned out to carry the actual content that it before that it had been thought that that was just a sort of a convenience product to recover electromagnetism. And it turned out that that geometric object was more important. And, you know, in part, the reason I bring this up is that we would have no way of visualizing this effect if it were not for your interaction with MC Escher. Uh, now you'll have to explain that one. <laughs> well, which, um, you yeah. know this 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 etching called ascending and descending. Oh yeah, sure. Yeah, which is so, sometimes referred to as the Penrose stairs. Yes. Well, you you want that story? <laughs> well, uh, yes. I do. But yes. what I was going to say about why sure. I'm asking yeah, yeah. for it, yeah, is that the photon is really best represented in some sense as the angles of a set of stairs like that with mm -hmm. this very mysterious property that That's what you're really talking yeah. about is what we would call horizontal subspaces pictured as stairs and the fact that there's a paradox of going around and you seem to be going up all the time but you're back to where you came is the yeah. same thing as saying i never go up and yet i come back higher or lower and that's called holonomy and we don't have a means of visualizing that except yes. for like either rock paper scissors or your work with escher is that a fair comment well, I had. I mean, there's a is this the first time you've ever heard somebody say this? Well, let me. See. I mean, there's a, there's a quite complicated story here. All right. You see, when I was a graduate student in Cambridge, um, I think it was in my second year when the International Congress of Mathematicians took place in Amsterdam, and so I and a few friends decided we would go to this meeting, and I remember. Uh, I think I was just about to get on a bus or a tram or something, and Sean Wiley, who was a lecturer in, in uh, algebraic topology, um, was just about to get off the bus I was getting on, and he had this catalog in his hand of uh, an exhibition in the Van Gogh Museum, and this was a picture of the, it, the, the one called Night and Day with birds flying off oh, in, into the day and the night and, and they cha cha the birds change into the spaces between the birds one way you go. And I just look at this and I think, well, that's amazing. What is that? Where on earth did it come from? He said, oh, well, this, you'd be very interested. This is this. Uh, in the Van Gogh Museum, there is this exhibition by an artist called Escher. So I'd never heard of him before. And I went to this exhibition and I was absolutely blown away. <laughs> I thought it was the most amazing thing. I remember particularly the one called Relativity, where people walk up the stairs and gravity directions in two different ways. And, and uh, I thought this was hugely impressive. And I went away thinking, well, I'd like to do something impossible, you see. And I didn't see, I had an idea about an impossible structure with bridges and roads and things like that. So locally it makes sense, but as a whole, it was inconsistent. And I didn't think I'd seen anything quite like that in his exhibition. So I played around with this, and then I sort of whittled it down to the triangle, which people refer to as a tri-bar. So, so it, it's, 
triangle, which is locally a completely consistent picture, but as a whole, it's impossible. And I showed this to my father, and then he started drawing impossible buildings, and, and then he came up with this staircase. So we decided we'd like to write a paper together on this, and we had no idea what the subject was. I mean, what, who, who, <laughs> who do you send a paper like this to? What journal? So he decided, since he knew the editor of the British Journal of Psychology, and he thought he'd be able to get it through, the <laughs> we decided the subject was psychology. Of course, it's, as you say, it's, not, it, it's more, in a way, mathematics, because it illustrates ideas, well, of cohomology and other things like that, which, which uh, I didn't quite know I was illustrating <laughs> at the time. But anyway, we wrote this paper, and uh, we gave some reference to Escher, I think, uh, uh, reference to the catalogue. And my father sent a copy to a, a Dutch friend of his, and he managed to get it to Escher. And then my father and Asher had a correspondence. Um, so that was... This is Lionel Penrose. Lionel. My father, Lionel right. Penrose, yes. But I, I actually visited Asher then. And, and um, he had sent a print to my father with a dedication to it. And he gave me another. So I, and I have in, in the Bodleian... But in some sense, yeah, so the uh, Ashmolean Museum. You see, I'm very indebted to you for this for this reason because when I <laughs> when I have to describe what general relativity is, yeah, and I don't wish to lie the way everyone else lies. If I'm going to lie, I'm going to do it differently. <laughs> I say that you have to begin with four degrees of freedom, and then you have to put rulers and protractors uh, into that system so that you can measure length and angle. That gives rise miraculously to a derivative operator that measures rise over run. Mm. That rise is measured from a reference level. Those reference levels don't knit together and they form Penrose stairs. And the degree of Escherness or Penroseness is what is measured by the curvature tensor, which breaks into three pieces. You throw one of them away called the vial curvature and you readjust the proportions of the other two and you set that equal to the amount of stuff. Now that's a very long <laughs> causal chain, yeah. but it is linguistically an accurate description of what general relativity actually is. Yeah, well, it illustrates that. It also illustrates cohomology, which I, I was being interviewed, oh, ages ago by, I don't know whether it was BBC, I can't remember what it was. There was an interview, which for some reason, they were interested in twister theory. Now, they think they're interested. Well, they thought they were. I guess they'd heard the word or something. Right. And at one point they say, well, <laughs> surprisingly, not at the beginning, they asked me what, what good it was. You see, what can you use it for? So I said, oh, you can use it to solve Maxwell's equations, you see. And that's equations of electricity and magnetism and light. And so they got a bit interested. And they said, oh, well, how do you do that? Well, it actually involves an idea that I couldn't really explain here. It, it's not possible to, in a, in a sort of popular talk like this. No, no, what is it exactly? No, 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 I couldn't do it. No, what's the, it's an idea, it's a thing called cohomology. No way I could explain that. So then I went back at home and, and I, I was lying in my bed and I thought, I think I can't, you know, it's this impossible triangle. That's exactly an illustration of cohomology. So I, I went back the next day and told them that they weren't interested. <laughs> They didn't use it. I think I may have tried to explain. Yes, we have a something which is locally consistent, right? But with an ambiguity about it. So here, the ambiguity is you're not quite sure. You draw a picture of it. The ambiguity is that you don't know how far away it is. It could be bigger and further away, or smaller and closer. And the picture is consistent, but but you get an inconsistency if you go around, right? And locally. Because you have a freedom, yes, and you misuse this freedom in a sense. So the glitch in it is this impossible structure. Well, I, I, I had this. So this is actually my son, my fourteen-year-old son's copy of this I book. See. Yes, and I was having to describe this to him. Com yes. what cohomology was, and I said yeah, yeah. Um, that one forms, which is a piece of technology uh, in mathematics that you can analogize to radar guns, so that uh, while you're driving and the policeman shoots your car with a radar gun, he's measuring the component of speed in the direction of his gun. Yeah. And so that's something that eats the vector of speed and spits out a number. Yeah. And then you could imagine a, a racetrack that wanted to have a circular 
a series of radar guns to measure the speed of cars going around it. Now, the question is, you also recognize that you could build a poor man's version of a speed system by heating the track to some temperature and measuring how quickly the temperature changed as the car went over it. Oh, I see, yeah, yeah. But you can't actually have the one thing that you want, which is the series of radar guns that are always measuring the speed going okay, around the track because at some point if the temperature is going down, 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 then it's going to be 10 degrees below wherever it started, which is yeah. your paradox again. Yes. Well, there's a nice example somebody made, I don't remember who, where you accompany, you have a ball going up the stairs or down it, whichever right. it is, and you accompany that with, a, with a, a, a note going up or down, and you can make it sound as though it keeps on going all the way up and all the way up all the time. By, it's by, by the harmonics. You bring a new harmonic in as you go it, around. You below, and it, yes, it's yes. sub-perceptual. So there, there's this auditory illusion that captures these. Yes, you have an auditory version of the same thing. And somebody yeah. had this ball bouncing around with that. That's not. <laughs> People, but that's a bit of a cheat. Well, you, I mean, my point would be that your Escher stairs or your yeah. Penrose stairs are, the, the cheat is that it appears to be flat. In other words, it's very easy to achieve that on a curved object, but that what you did was to create the illusion as taking place in a plane or- Well, you can draw it in a plane. In a rectilinear system. That yeah. you have an interpretation of a three-dimensional thing, which which is an ambiguous interpretation. So you saw the movie Inception, of course, where they, they realized this action. Yes, they, they have an illustration of that there, that's right.